for that. Okay, Romans chapter 9. Um, as we teach these things, you need to be thinking, you need to be evaluating and judging the text of Scripture as far as how you're going to interpret it, evaluating my teaching. I'm going to present it in a way that, that I think makes sense. And I think chapter 8 has kind of wrapped up a portion of Paul's theology. He's explained the church, is explained uh, sin, explained justification, explained maturity, sanctification. And it's now has gone into we are in Christ and we are destined for glorification. Who can separate us from this great plan that we're in? And that would be a great ending. And it is, I think, in a sense, an ending because beginning in chapter 9, one of the clues is, as we say right here, that there's no connecting conjunction. As you see in other places, they'll say, therefore, you know, or because of. I mean, he builds his case and then says, because that's true, now we move on. He has ended. He, it's not like an abrupt break. It's not like a completely different subject. But he is going to switch the issue. He's going to start talking about Israel because he just talked about the church being in this great plan. But now it's like, now, what about Israel? And so he's going to continue writing, continue teaching, but he's going to address a very important issue, especially in 57 AD, as Israel had rejected the Messiah, their message, their Messiah, the message had gone out into the Gentile world, had come all the way to Rome, and Paul hasn't even been to Rome. The message of Christ had divided synagogues, caused riots, riots, in the synagogues and in the streets of Rome, so much so that the emperor had to go through three phases, no more meeting in synagogues, closing the synagogues, no more Jews assembling, and then finally, Jews get out of town. Go somewhere else, you can't be in Rome, because they are arguing and protesting against each other's views of Jesus Christ. And so there are, by this time it appears the Jews have begun to trickle back in, the emperors have changed, and the, and the Jews have begun trickling back in. But it was still, what about these people? They've got the Old Testament covenants, and we're not even addressing Paul. It's not even addressing the law of Moses, teaching the dietary laws. He's not teaching them about visiting the temple. He's, not, he's talking about faith in Jesus Christ, the Jewish Messiah, based on the Jewish prophecies. But what about the whole culture of Jews? Not even going there. Because he knows, as Jesus has addressed, they're, they're under judgment. They're going to be... You know, there's not going to be one stone left upon another when we're finished with this phase. And we know that takes place in 70 AD. So Paul knows that's coming. But yet, what about Jerusalem? And so one of the or Israel. And so one of the things that's cl clear here in chapter 9, verse 1, is there's no connecting uh, uh, conjunction. There's nothing saying like, therefore. He begins this way. I speak the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience confirms it in the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, those of my own race, the people of Israel. And then he goes on, he's going to describe, well, I'll just read it. There, theirs, Israel, is the adoption of sons. There's the divine glory, the covenants, the receiving of the law, the temple worship, and the promises. Theirs are the patriarchs, and from them is traced the human ancestry of Christ, who is God over all, forever praised. Amen. So it's very positive towards Israel as far as their place, uh, Paul being concerned about them. But he begins by saying these, and I've got them written here on the board. Now all my notes, I, I wrote there uh, chapter 1, or chapter 9, verse 1, and then I made a statement I could wish. That's really coming later on. That's not in chapter 1, or verse 1. That should be chapter 9, verses 1 through 3, those first couple lines. There, so keep that in mind. I forgot to put a dash three there, or combine those. But <clears throat> you see in chapter one, chapter nine, verses one through three, these double expressions to intensify. For example, he says, I'm telling you the truth, I'm not lying. My conscience confirms it, the Holy Spirit confirms it. I have great sorrow, it's unceasing anguish. I would rather be cursed or cut off. My brothers, my own race. So he says the same thing all the way through there. He says it twice. When he says, I'm telling the truth, what do you mean? I mean I'm not lying. My conscience confirms this. What do you mean? The Holy Spirit confirms it. Great sorrow. How, how, what do you mean? How great? It's, it's unceasing anguish sorrow. Cursed. As in, what do you mean cursed? As in, cut off. My brothers. What, how, what kind of brothers? 
my own race. My, not, not the brothers in Christ, not brothers in the family, but my own race. So it's all of these either intensify each other or they clarify each other, what Paul's talking about. He's saying, I'm not lying. I, I'm completely convict or convinced that this is true, even the Holy Spirit. He says, I have great sorrow. My heart is broken. I would rather be cursed and punish myself for my own race, if I could somehow reach him. And that's what's driven Paul several times. And in fact, you know, this is 57 AD. He's writing from Corinth, and what is his next move historically? Is to get on a ship and sail to Jerusalem to bring money to the Jewish church or the Jewish or Christian believers, and maybe somehow preach them. And it appears, as we've talked about, he sounded a slam dunk, but God is telling him all the way, don't go, don't go. If you go, you're just going to get arrested. You're not going to, these people, that's not your place. Go back to the Western world. Go back to the Gentiles. But he says right here, I'd rather be cursed, cut off for my brothers. I want to do something. And so he goes there with the offering, tries to get a chance to preach. All he gets is arrested, and he spends the next five years in prison, as we know. So that's, this is written just months before he goes to Jerusalem and gets, and gets arrested. This is, his, this is his passion. So he's talking about Israel. He's no longer talking about the church. That's, he's not spent eight, eight chapters in it. He's talking about Israel. Now, it doesn't mean these verses don't have application to the church, but he's addressing Israel, maybe to clarify some issues that the Christians would have. Okay, so chapter 9, verse 1 again. I speak the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience confirms it in the Holy Spirit. So what he's talking about, he said, I'm telling you the truth. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. I'm always heartbroken, no matter how far the gospel goes, there's a nagging pain in my heart I just can't let go of. He says, For I would wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers. If there's one thing, no matter how victorious I am in the church or victorious in my life, there's one thing in my past I wish I could go back and change. You know, I, I, would, I would throw everything away if I could go back and change this one thing. Many people have something like that in their life. I'd give it all if I could change this one thing. And what is the thing that's bothering him? I can't reach my nation. My nation does not respond to the Messiah. And again, Paul was one of those. Paul was one of those who had rejected Jesus Christ. He was killing those who had accepted Jesus Christ. He was trying to purify the nation. He was doing the right thing, he thought. And then he met Jesus Christ and realized, I mean, they're as blind, he says, as, as I was. And there's nothing, someone's got to help them. And he describes them. Theirs is the adoption of sons. Now these blessings that are going to be listed here, there's Israel's blessings. We'll look at some of these things here in the Old Testament. But there's Israel's blessings. And this is important, not important, but it is foundational. We are the church, but we are the church that has been blessed through Israel. Not Israel hasn't blessed us, but God's covenant with Israel with Abraham, the promises, the prophets, the Messiah, the word of God, his communicating us the special revelation, came through Israel. And now, with the death of Christ, his resurrection, and Jesus' command, the Great Commission, go to all the Gentiles. All the world will be blessed. All the nations. Abraham's promise in Genesis chapter 12. Go and bring the promise. Don't bring the law. Bring the promise. And so, Paul is going to list... Israel's blessings, theirs is these things, which when you look at them, they all sound familiar because they're all now with the church. And here we go. These are, these are originally Israel's blessings. They're still Israel's blessings. Paul's going to continue to talk about this in chapter 9, 10, and 11, this, this issue. He says, uh, theirs, Israel, theirs is the adoption as sons. Notice they were adopted as sons. They weren't a great people. They weren't a special people. They were created from the very hand of God. They were a Gentile people that God chose. They, they were adopted. Again, the idea there, they were outside the family of God. Abraham, Israel, was outside the family of God, and he adopted them in. And that's exactly what happens to the believers. We are adopted into the family. Uh, theirs is the adoption as sons. Theirs the divine glory. The glory rests with Israel. Uh, it, it, it was, you know, in the wilderness. It was in the temple. It was on, on, on Jerusalem. Now that same glory, if you, if you consider that the presence of God, the presence of the Holy Spirit, uh, the Shekinah glory, that is 
what has come into us. On the day of Pentecost, the Spirit came in. Jesus Christ is with us. The church has, as individual believers and as a group, the corporate church, they are, they have that divine glory. The covenants. Now, covenants are, we've talked about this in the different classes, there are conditional or unconditional covenants. And in an unconditional covenant is God says, I am going to do this. And then it's just a matter of time before he does it and he promises somebody, I'll do this. There's conditional covenants would be, I'll do this if you'll do this. And they're, within the, they're both, all both within the text of scripture. But the Abrahamic covenant is an example of an unconditional covenant. I am going, to, I've chosen Israel, I'm going to use, Abraham's descendants will bless all the nations. Now, that's an unconditional covenant with what he's going to do with Israel. Uh, we, we enter into that covenant by faith in Jesus Christ. We enter into a covenant. And we just ended, in a sense, an unconditional covenant at the end of chapter 8. If you are in this covenant, it is now un- if you have faith, you've entered into an unconditional covenant. God is going to do this with those who are in Christ. Now, if you remain outside of Christ, you need to get into that covenant. But nonetheless, they have a covenant, which is going to include a plan for Israel. It is still going to have an individual choice. Are you going to buy into that covenant? Are you going to believe the covenant? A covenant, especially an unconditional covenant, has its advantage when you trust it, when you believe it. If you doubt it, if you reject it, and we're going to get there, you're not really in the covenant. You have no benefit of the covenant. There's the adoption of sons. There's the divine glory. The covenant, and notice it's plural, so we've got to be careful because you've got the Mosaic Covenant, you've got the Abrahamic Covenant, you've got the Davidic Covenant, you've got the Land Covenant, what we call the Palestinian Covenant. You've got a variety of different covenants. Then you've got individual covenants with individual people. And God comes and chooses some individual, says, your family will be blessed because you did this for me, because you did this, I'll bless your family. Or, you didn't do this, I'm going to now attack your family. Others is the covenants, the receiving of the law. And again, law, that sounds negative, but at the same time, that was his revelation. That was him coming down and saying, okay, let me introduce reality to you. Instead of you going off and trying to find the spiritual reality through these foreign gods, these pagan gods, these demonic spirits, come here, I will write it down for you. This is reality. So the law wasn't so much a, a bunch of do's, yes, and you know, or, or don'ts, or whatever. It was more of God revealing himself and his reality to people that, that couldn't find it in the natural realm. That's the, that's the law, the receiving of the law. The temple worship or the temple services, which themselves were participating with the presence of God, but also every one of the temple services, if it be the morning or evening sacrifice, if it be one of the, the holy days, one of the feasts, always had within it some kind of a teaching or some kind of a message that went along with it. Jesus picked up on that many times. John does a good job in the, in the Gospel of John of connecting Jesus to different feasts as he's going through. So those, those, the temple worship was not just coming in and worshiping God, although that would be a blessing in itself, or being in the presence of God. There was also within the temple worship a teaching, a, a revelation, an understanding that was taking place. Uh, the temple worship, and here it is, the promises. And the promises would begin from you know the days of Abraham all the way through. You would be a great nation. All nations would be blessed through you. And says, theirs are the patriarchs. These are the men that received. And again, the patriarchs said men. But that would include in the heroes of faith. It mentions Sarah. It mentions women that are, are participating in this. You know, Samson's mom, Hannah, uh, Samuel's mom. All these people that were the patriarchs. Usually you think of patriarchs as, as the men. But there were women who came in and God spoke to them. Many times you see, and we can go through the book of Judges here to see this. You see the men being the ones that didn't respond, the losers, and God had to come to the, the women, the wives, the mothers, and speak to them, and they'd have to rise up and lead the men. Deborah, a classic example. The, the general himself had no faith. I'm not going to go, that's a weird prophecy. I'll go if you go. She goes, fine, but the victory's not going to be yours. It's going to go to a woman, some woman hiding in a tent or staying at home in the tent doing dishes or something. She ends up being the one who kills the general because the general was afraid to follow God. And so Deborah rose up, because no one else would step up. No one else. She says, she says there is, you remember Judges? The book of Judges, the Deborah story? The song, her and, uh, what's his name? I don't know, not Jabin. Uh, who is her commander? Sarah. 
Cicero was the guy they killed. Barrett. What? Barrett. Barrett. Thank you, Barrett. Her and Barrett sang a duet at the end. I don't know, just think. Yeah, yeah, we, we, we have some time to do that. But within that song, the line goes, we can go back there and look at it, but the line goes about how the, you couldn't travel in the streets. Uh, there was no weapons. We were being overrun. There's no place to go until a mother, a mother in Israel arose. It was, I, I, you, know, you read it how you want to, but it's kind of like you've got generals, you've got the military, you've got all the judges, you've got all these people that God has chosen. And it's like none of them are doing anything. Everybody's just you know, making treaties and trying to compromise and, and make sure we've got trade agreements and no one's offended. And then finally it's like a mother. It's like we can't even travel anywhere. We can't even walk to the market without being attacked. So finally Deborah, a mother in Israel, rose and says, this is enough. And God says, good enough, Deborah, take off. And Deborah took control, and now the general has to follow her. And so that's kind of interesting right there. That's one of the judges in Israel, nonetheless. The patriarchs. And again, that's just one example of the patriarchs. Story after story of the patriarchs who stepped up in faith, receiving the promise, believing the promise, and didn't see end times, didn't necessarily see God perform all the things he's promised, but they saw in their day, in their generation, as a believer in the promise to Israel, they stepped up, took it personally, and made a difference in their community, in their society, made a difference in history, and then they passed away, and history marched on. Those were the patriarchs. So again, their Israel's, theirs are the patriarchs, those who responded in faith to the adoption, to the divine glory, to the temple. They stepped up and did something with it. And from them is traced the human ancestry of Christ, which just all comes down to the only reason we're saved, the only reason we can even understand these things, is the Jewish Messiah came, taught, died on the cross, was resurrected, and left behind more revelation, and then sent the Spirit to give the apostles more divine insight, and we have the text of Scripture. So the Christ who saved us and communicated with us, the Word became flesh, and dwelt among us, we have more understanding. Theirs is the ancestry of Christ. So without Israel, there is no Christian church. Without, without, without Israel, there's no blessing. There's no salvation. There's no, nothing to get excited about because there's no Savior. There's no even understanding of sin. You'd be in a, some kind of pagan situation. There would be no connection with reality. From them is traced the human an ancestry of Christ, who is God over all, forever praised. Amen. Now, you may want to take note of that phrase, ancestry of Christ, who is God overall. Because this is something people will say. The, the further away you get from the text of Scripture, the more liberal things become, the more they're going to paint Jesus into a corner with, you know, uh, Muhammad and Buddha and the Pharaohs and Alexander the Great and, and Jesus, and he's just a great figure. It's like, and they say, well, the church, you know, the Pope... Uh, the, the the Roman Church or whatever they had to deify Jesus. They brought a, they took a man, a Jewish man, and made him into God. This is going to be a liberal argument that you're going to have to address. I addressed it back in the '70s when I was in college, um, or had it. You know, that's what they were teaching. But the idea here is right here in a book written in 57 A.D. Is this text? I was in a church that said I was listening to a pastor in a church when I was a teenager who says. Jesus never claimed to be God. That was something we strap on him. It's like Jesus was a man who went around and did good and let, gave us an example. It's his, he was just a, a, you know, a Martin Luther King type of guy. He was just a, a good political activist going out and helping people and, and inter, you know, just oh, sorry for all the people suffering. And so he went out and tried to make a difference. And if we all follow Jesus, go out and try to make a difference, we too can make a world a better place. Now you break away and you sing John Lennon's song, Imagine. It's like, no, no. In 57 AD, the human ancestry of Christ, who is God over all. Now your argument is going to have to be in the text. Well, the church added that. That, was, that wasn't originally written by Paul. Later on, the church just added that. So now it's a matter of going back to the manuscripts and finding the earliest manuscripts you can is that line there. Is Paul writing in 57 AD that Christ is God? And with that, I'm going to break away because now you're going to go into the text. You go back to the early church fathers like we talked about on Monday nights or we're going through church history now. And these guys are quoting the book of Romans. They're quoting Corinthians by 90 AD, by 100 AD, by 110 AD. They're, they're giving the, the deity of Jesus Christ the credit for being God. And so that's a huge statement. I mean, when the pastor stood up and says, 
Nowhere in the Bible does Jesus claim to be God. Well, you've got all those I am statements, you know. Jesus is saying, you will see the Son of Man coming back. He's being arrested by the high priest, being slapped around by the high priest. He says, you're going to see me. I'll tell you. You're going to see I'm coming back in the glory of God. I will be. It's like, you're looking into the face of God right now, he was telling them. And you're going to be very disappointed because even in, we talk about John, begins, even those who pierced him will see him when he returns. And that's when Israel mourns for the one they pierced. It's like, oh my gosh. And the nations run and hide because hide us from him who sits on the throne from the wrath of God. Jesus Christ is God. Jesus Christ is coming back. And there it is right here. It's a huge statement. It's politically very divisive. Because if Jesus Christ is God, that means a whole lot of others are not and are either have to be submissive or are going to be called considered rebels. And this is reality or it's fiction. I mean, it's got to go one way or the other. So anyway, that's Paul saying, and says, Ancestry of Christ comes from Israel, who is God over all, forever praised, amen. So once he gets on this line, verses 1 through 5, it ends up in a, in a run of glory statements. One, talks about his own conviction. Then he goes on and lists the things that Israel was blessed with, including having produced the fulfilled prophecy from the Garden of Eden. The seed of the woman will produce a son that will overcome Satan and crush Satan's head and take over. That's the beginning. That's from the Garden of Eden. That was the promise. So Christ is from the beginning to the end. Israel had that blessing. Israel had those promises. And they are now, Israel has, in a sense, when it began to be fulfilled, they rejected it. And that's when Paul's brought it to the church. These are now the church's blessings. Now, they still have come historically through Israel to the Gentile world, just like it says in Genesis chapter 12. All nations will be blessed. They'll have an opportunity to enter into this promise. But now, what about Israel? And that's where Paul's going to go with this. Verse 6. It is not as though God's word had failed. So, all the promises, all the patriarchs, all the law giving, all the temple worship, it's just, it just going to be set aside? It's just failed? It's like, well, no, it's, it's progressed through Israel, and it's got us to this point right here. But now we've got to go back to this, and this is where Paul's going. This, this is a big deal right here, where we're heading with this. Israel's blessing, clearly it came through Israel, the church now has it. The Gentile world has it. But with Israel, there's going to be certain words like chosen, called, God's people, loved. Israel was chosen. Israel was God's people. They were the ones that were the loved ones. They were called. And so what is going to happen now with Israel? Because they have said no to the promise. Now again, we've got individuals. Is Peter a Jew? Yes, he's full board on full board with the gospel message to the Gentiles. P. Paul, he's clearly a Jew that has come over to the, he's now a member of the church. Well, when they sent the money down to the Jerusalem believers, to the church, they weren't just sending it to the, feed the Jews. Paul was taking money to feed, to provide for the Jewish Christians in Jerusalem because of the oppression they were suffering from the non-believing Jews. So they even distinguish between these are all Jewish people but the non-believing Jews are persecuting the believing Jews. And so we're bringing them money from the Gentile churches to support them. And it was Paul's attempt, as a good, good thing to do, to show we're, we're, in the same, we're on the same page. We are recognizing Jesus Christ, the Jewish Messiah, has come. And the Gentiles are even receiving that promise. They're even receiving that blessing. And so now the blessing given to Israel has come to the church and including many of the Jews have individually received it as being members of the church. But what about Israel? It looks like all the things God said, all, and it, this, is, this, is, this is a tipping point right here. Somewhere in this discussion, you're going to have to go one way or the other. Or maybe trying to just find a balance, I guess. Is Israel has given all those promises, but they crucified the Messiah. They rejected. Jesus was face to face with the high priest. The high priest was slap, having Jesus slapped, and Jesus was rejecting the high priest. He was, he was arguing, not in the sense of, of theological, but he was, he was challenging their legal actions. So you've got the Messiah, who is God, forever praised, standing in front of his high priest in Jerusalem, and they're arguing with each other. And the high priest is eventually going to get Jesus nailed on the cross, because he doesn't match the high priest's model. 
So you've got a huge breakdown. God's chosen people, Israel, their leadership, and, and again, we're standing around in the crowd, they all shouted, crucify him, crucify him. So you can hang this on the priest, you can hang this on the leadership, hang this on the Sanhedrin, hang this on the, the, the community of the Jewish people in 30 AD. They have rejected everything God has given to them through the, the covenants, the patriarchs, the promises, the law, the temple worship. They said no. So now Paul's saying, well, now, has God's word failed? So all that stuff, we just tear those pages out of the Old Testament and move on into a new age of new revelation. And we'll talk about this when we start talking about the Gnostics and different things in the early church. They're trying to separate this out because the Old Testament God is different than the New Testament God, which is not true. So Paul's, now that's where he's going. Is it, it, it is not as though God's word had failed. He says no. He says there's not a failure here on God's word. There's not a failure here on God's promises. God is not going to reset and start over. You're just in the middle of history. Things began, they're progressing, and you don't see the end yet. And so now we're in 57 AD. It's like, well, Jerusalem's completely rejecting the message of, of Jesus Christ. They're, they're even persecuting those who are accepting it, their own people. And now Paul is writing to the Romans from Corinth, a Gentile city, to Rome, you know, further west, and saying, wait, wait, don't miscount or discount Israel. Don't discount God's word. Just because you're in the middle of history and the game isn't over, and you can't, can't how, do you, how do you connect all this? Paul's going to try to make that connection. This is the beginning. These are the promises. This is where we're at. And from that position, we can project where this is going. So here he says, It is not as though God's word had failed. It's not a losing cause. We're in the middle of a, a historical event that doesn't look good, but wait, God's word is going to be fulfilled. For not all who are descended from Israel are Israel. Now, that's, it's like, whoa, so not all that come from Israel are Israel? So let's, let's go ahead and erase this. And he's going to begin now a breakdown to prove, and I hope I don't bore you with this. Now, Israel is a nation, and we've got these people. We've got, for example, Abraham, and he's got a son named Isaac who's going to have two sons named Jacob and Esau. I, I should have written those up just for the sake of, so I don't get in trouble later. Esau is born first. They tied a red string around his wrist, remember? They're twins. And then they're going to have, oh, Abraham also is going to have, from Abraham is also going to be Ishmael. Okay, and that's another story. And people forget about this, or at least I just didn't put it in here, didn't plan for it in my little diagram. It's in my notes. After Abraham, after Sarah died, what did Abraham do? He married Keturah. Uh, the correct spelling is in your notes. So you've got Abraham, the father of our faith, the Jewish faith. He's going to have the promised son, Isaac. But he, before Isaac is born, he's going to have a natural son called Ismael. Ishmael. So is Ishmael from Abraham? Yes. Then he's going to have Keturah. He's going to marry Keturah. And there's going to be, oh, it's in the Bible, the list of a numerous sons that were born through Keturah that he's going to send off to the east, away from the promised son of Isaac. Ishmael's going to go to the east. Abraham realizes Isaac is the problem. He made a mistake, got, a little, got ahead of the game, tried to make it happen. And then he understands it. But he still marries Keturah, which wasn't a mistake. I don't think there's a mistake. And he has a number of substance, but he is wise enough to say, we're not going to bring them into the promise because this is for Isaac. God's running a plan here. And he sends them away so they wouldn't interfere with each other, which is just a general idea, uh, a good idea. Just keep your family members, well, we do that too. You go, boys, move. Move away. Stay away from each other. We'll see you at Christmas. Okay, get on the planes, fly back home. Don't, don't stay here. It's not going to work out right now. I'm not sure. I'm sure my boys will all get along well. <clears throat> and then Isaac, to even complicate issues, there's going to be twins. You can't get any closer than twins. Except Esau was born first. But God is going to make it very clear. Jacob is the one. He's going to choose Jacob. He's going to say the younger, or the older will serve the younger. The younger one is going to receive the blessing. So it goes from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then from Jacob, we're going to have the 12 tribes. This is going to become the nation of 
Israel. So the point right here that Paul or Paul is making is from the very get-go, not everybody, and he's going to build on this, not everybody born genetically is part of this plan. There is a group of people that are in this special plan. Now, again, the special, there's plan, there's purpose, there's a calling, there's a choosing. None of that is referring to an individual. It's referring to God's working a plan. God's working a purpose. God's calling this and is choosing this line. And is going to be involved with this, the key word right here, a promise, which another word for promise is covenant. And you're going to have to receive the covenant. You're going to have to believe the promise. You're going to have to join this. But to look at the promise... To look at the covenant is to reject this and you're going to be one who hates God because you said no to the covenant. In other words, you can, look at Esau, he sold the covenant. Legally, he had the promises. He had the land. He was the, he was the heir. And he sold it for food. So he really didn't understand that he was more interested in the temporary right now I'm here with this deal right now. He's not looking at the big plan, the purpose, the calling, the choosing, where this is going. Jacob, for some reason, saw it. He understood it. He knew this is bigger than you and me, Esau. I want into this. He was willing to lie. I mean, how do you justify that? He's lying. He's deceiving. He's faking and acting things out so we can get... Again, you can go back and say, that doesn't even make sense. They didn't sign a contract. But he went in and made his father promise him verbally to his ears the covenant. It's like, well, he was deceived. Right. But you've been deceived also. You signed the document. And they say, I'm sorry. You signed up for and you also have to pay for this whatever. Have you ever signed something and agreed to something? You go, I didn't know why I was signing up for that. It's like, sorry. You still have, have you ever done that with anything? I mean, you can, you can call all the time you want to say, this wasn't fair. I didn't know it. Yeah, but you clicked the button. I, I didn't realize I was doing it. Yeah, sorry. And if you go to court, you got to get your attorney's line. It's like, you know, it's in the fine print. And in this culture, that's important because this is the beautiful part about this on several dimensions is it sounds like a stupid story to us. You read it to your children and, and Jacob comes in all, you know, pretending he's Esau, got the little wool on here, his, his, the, the goat skin on and says, oh, I'm, you know, it sounds like you sound like Jacob. Oh, 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 no, this is Esau. It's like, I mean, this is flat out lying. This is deception. This is media manipulation. It's like, this is not even fair. And it's like, but yet, there it is. That's how they voted. That's your decision. It's like, sorry, that's the laws of the land. And this was the law of the land. If you could get the blessing. Now, I'm going to throw this, I'm just going to throw this out there. Uh, just because this will help clear up some things, I mean, at least put it in your thinking, is remember when Noah and his had three sons, uh, Ham, Sham, Shem, and Japheth. And he, he, he says he got drunk. And, and he was in his tent, and Ham came in and saw his nakedness. It's like, whoa, what's going on in this story? Right. To the 21st century, you know, postmodern American in the Western world, sounds like some kind of homosexual activity here. Uh, sounds like some kind of a, you know, poor taste post on Facebook. He took a, you know, an Instagram selfie with his father naked in the tent. It's like, may, yeah, maybe. It's because right there, it's, we're talking Noah, if you believe Noah's story, which I do. I think it's documented in the text of Scripture. I think we've got Noah's diary. You're putting this thing, you're going back 2,000 2400 B.C., maybe back to 3000 B.C. We're talking 5,000 years ago, and he sees his father's nakedness. What in the world is he talking about? Whatever it was, it was so bad, I think it was more than an Instagram photo, because he cursed him, cursed his line, and says, forever, you're cut off. You will never, never have this. And it dealt with some kind of, 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 of moving away distribution of land. Here is what they found it again. 
This is not a slam dunk, but there has been some recent research and some finding and some readings and some other ancient documents. And you can see this in the text of Scripture. If this makes sense, I'm way off subject. But we're talking about handing down this, this contract, this covenant, this promise. That part of it, remember, you've seen when they come here and they get the promise, I want to bless you, and they would come, they put their hand under the thigh. They put and come, it'd be like, you know, we shake hands or, or we, you know, sign contracts. Or they would come and they would put their hand under the, the elder's thigh. They would, they would get close enough, and then from that position, they would bless them. I mean, it would be some kind of, say, well, that's, why would they have to do that? Why do we shake hands? Why do we salute? Why do we, like, yo, you know, why do we fist bump? You know, and then they met at home plate, they fist bump. What's that mean? It's like, don't worry about it. It's what they did in the 21st century. This is what they did 5,000 years ago. This is how they exchanged the lesson. And it appears, one way of reading this, you can see this in some ancient writings. Again, I, 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 this is just a suggestion. But also when I read this, like, oh my gosh. There was, coming out of Noah, the promise had already been given. And he's got three sons. It's going to go to one of those three. The seed of the woman is going to go one of these three ways. The promise of the Messiah. Shem, Ham, or Japheth. Ham wants it. And it included the land. The promised land. Say, so, you, know, you can see where they all are distributed from, where they all go. Who ends up in the promised land? Shem ends up at that. Japheth goes north, Ham goes south, and, and different directions. But Shem ends up with that area of, of the promised land. It appears that what Ham, even then, Ham, people would say, as some scholars have written, Ham was trying to get this blood. He was doing the same thing that Jacob did to Isaac. He went to Noah, and while Noah was in some kind of a drunken stupor, sleeping in one time, he went in and puts his hand under his thigh, sees his nakedness, and tries to get it. When his father woke up and found out what he'd done, he came in. It was Jacob came in and deceived you to get the blessing, and it wasn't his. And he says, no. He says, and he cursed him. He said, he cursed him and drove him away, and it ends up with Shem. Now, again, the, 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 all you've got in the text of Scripture is Ham seeing his father's nakedness, getting cursed, and Noah really getting ticked off. Just, I mean, takes his son and curses him and sends him away. It's like something big happened, bigger than, you know, a, a Facebook post or a snapshot on Instagram. So anyway, this, the reason I say all that is kind of explain this whole, this handing out of this promise. Okay, does that make sense at all? Yeah, first time you heard that? I mean, that's... All right, we got time. Here we go. All right. What, what Paul is doing in chapter 9, verse 6 now, is not all Israel, not everyone descended in this line gets the promise. It's going to involve God's plan, God's purpose, God's calling, God choosing which way it's going to go. And it's going to be God's choice. Is it Japheth? Is it Ham? Or is it Shem? Is it Ishmael? Is it Isaac? Or is it one of Keturah's sons? It's Abraham. Then it's Isaac, well, is it Jacob or Esau? Even before they were born, they were told the younger will rule the older or the older will serve the younger. The promise is going this direction. Jake. So, the story about Jacob, I don't want to push this too far, but did Jacob need to deceive his father? The promise was already made. You get it. You don't need to deceive your dad. You don't need to spend 20 years in, away in, in, in the land of uh, 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 Mesopotamia, not Mesopotamia, but up in Haran, you could have just waited. It's coming your way. Esau's going to eventually blow it, and you're going to get it. You don't need to cause it. And he ended up being the deceiver, the liar. And he was the struggle. Struggled with God. Oh, man, we're, I got so many things to say. Here it is, chapter, chapter 9, verse 6. It is not as though God's word had failed. For not all who descended from Israel are Israel, nor because are they the descendants are neither because they are his descendants are they all Abraham's children now genetically yes but not children of the promise on the contrary quote he quotes the Old Testament it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned not through anyone else not through so the word of God came it's going to be through Isaac your offspring will be reckoned not Israel but Israel Abraham had already we talked about that before Abraham, he was already a, a teenager. He was already older. He was, it's like, he's, I've got him trained. 
No, not the one. It's going to be through Isaac, not Ishmael. Ishmael's going to be blessed. God doesn't hate Ishmael. In fact, God tells him, he'll be blessed. He'll be a great people. He'll be fine. But he's not going to be chosen. I've got a plan for him. He's going to, basically, he's going to become one of the Gentile nations. Or become many Gentile nations. But he's not here. It's through Isaac. The covenant, the promise, my plan is coming. So first of all, we, we've already lost Ishmael. But he's born of Abraham. That's not it. It's, it's not being born of Abraham. It's being chosen. It's receiving the promise. In other words, it is not the natural children who are God's children. But it is the children of the promise. Who are regarded as Abraham's offspring. So this is going to be dealing with this word down here, promise, which is, again, involving a covenant. A promise, a covenant, we can almost make those synonyms at this point in the discussion. And so there's going to be a covenant that's going to come through these people, a promise that is given. All right, so remember that. In other words, it is not the natural children who are God's children, but it is the children of the promise who are regarded as Abraham's offspring. For this is how the promise was stated. At the appointed time, see now you've got an appointed time, God decided, not Isaac or Ishmael, I will return and Sarah will have a son. At the right time, this will kick in. Not only that, because so right here he says, he says, okay, so here we've got this list of people. I've added, Paul doesn't mention Keturah, he sticks with Ishmael and Isaac, but we could, we could add Keturah. Not only is Abraham's son, Abraham had already chosen Ishmael. We can see that. Because God has to tell him, no, it's not him. It's it's going to be him. Okay, fine. But then Paul says, not only that, he's proving his point. Not only that, but Rebecca's children had one and the same father, our father Isaac. You've got two of them. Isaac is now going to have, you thought Ishmael, Isaac was confusing. That's not so bad. They've got two different mothers. And one was said no. One was said yes. One was the promise. One was Abraham's idea. So there's the division. Now it's complicated. Now Isaac's wife is going to get pregnant. Oh, it's going to be the promised child. Guess what? It's twins. Well, now how are we going to decide this? Well, we better be ready and we better wait for that first one. He's the firstborn. It's like, that's it already said. That's not it. That's how you decide. It's not the first one out of the womb. It's the one I chose. It's not the first one born. It's the one I choose. It's not the first one born out of twins. It's the one I choose. Not only that, but Rebecca's children had one and the same father, our father Isaac. Yet before the twins were born or had done anything good or bad, in order that God's purpose in election might stand. Now, friends, this is a huge line. So that God's purpose in election might stand. I challenge you, don't run the way of the Calvinists right here. Election for salvation. We're not talking about anybody getting saved. Yet, we, we did, over at the end of chapter 8, that we're in the plan of God, and those he foreknew, he for, for, you know, predestined, those he, for, he, he, he uh, you know, okay, I'm rambling there. But anyway, we talked about the, in the church, but we're, we're talking about Israel now, and we're talking about Israel becoming a Gentile nation, Isaac receiving the promise, Keturah being sent to these. Now I've added this part of the discussion. Now Jacob and Esau. Yet before the twins were born, or had done anything good or bad, they weren't even born yet. They had no choice, chance to even make a decision, right or wrong, in order that God's purpose in election might stand. Notice again, God's got a purpose because he's executing a plan, so he's going to decide, he's going to choose. So that his purpose in election might stand, quote, verse 12, or not quote, but it goes on and says, not by works, but by him who calls, she was told. So now we've combined this. God's purpose might stand in election because he's got a plan. He's going to call. He's going to elect. He's going to call someone to fulfill the purpose, to execute the plan. It's going to be election. It's going to be Jacob. This, I know if I was arguing with Calvinists, they would be just lighting the torches and getting the stake ready because I'm under, I'm destroying everyone's faith and attacking God's sovereignty. This is not talking about Jacob getting saved. Esau's going to burn in the fires of hell and Jacob gets to go to heaven. 
That's not even the discussion. The discussion is the promise given to Abraham that was given to Isaac, that was given to Jacob, that Paul's rest, that was handed down to Israel, and theirs is the covenant. Theirs is the promise. Theirs is the divine glory. And, and, and they rejected it. It's like, he says, now, does that mean this whole thing's just for not? It just, it's, it's failed? No, no, no. We're in the middle of history. God going way back to Noah with Shem, Ham, and Japheth. If what I shared with Shem, Ham, and Japheth somehow ties into this, somehow it does because Shem was chosen from Noah and the other two sons went away. And Shem stayed there. Maybe it led to Melchizedek being in Jerusalem when, when, when Abraham got there and knew God Almighty. It comes down to Paul's day, comes down to our day, and we're still, how's this all working out? We still have questions about Israel. How's this all going to come together? Paul's saying, God's word hasn't failed. The promise is given to Israel. Well, let's keep reading. They're going to be fulfilled. God's purpose in election might stand, not by works, but by him who calls, she was told, that the older will serve the younger. God is going to call Jacob to this purpose. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is going to be put in line. Not by works, but by him who calls, she was told, the older will serve the younger. Just as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hate it. And that's out of Malachi. And we're going to look at some of those verses here. Quickly, do I have a chance? Do I have time to look at them quickly? I probably don't. I'm going to have to just drop this on you, and then we'll pick it up next week. And, and I've got these verses. Deuteronomy, Hosea, Deuteronomy 7, verses 6 through 11, and then ultimately Malachi, verses uh, uh, 1 through 5, where it talks about Esau and Jacob, and that's where Paul's quoting from. In chapter 7 of Deuteronomy... God is going to use the word to Israel. They're chosen. He's going to use the word going into this. Please, are you still with me? I've made these synonyms. Promise. Covenant. We don't have time to look at it, but if I went to Deuteronomy 7, verses 6 through 11, the word covenant and promise is going to be involved in this word love. Okay? God loved Israel. Oh, yes. The emotional love. Or if we just all got along and loved each other. This word, watch, it's the word love is going to be equal to a covenant because it's going to refer to keeping an oath. And those who hated God are those who rejected the oath. So I'm telling you, and i got to build this case next week, when it talks about those God loved. Israel was loved by God. What does that mean? They were given a promise. They were brought into a covenant. They were loved by God. But also, there are those that we're going to see are going to hate God. It's in Deuteronomy. Because right here in the same text of verse, oh shoot, I'm going to go read these. Chapter Deuteronomy. I just want to read these quickly so you can just see this. I'm not just tying this all up myself. So the verses are all packed together. Seven, chapter 7, verses 6 through 11. Chapter 7, 6 through 11. What you're looking for is the synonym value of covenant, promise, and loved. And those that God loved, he gave a covenant to. But when you get someone a covenant, if they reject it, if they say no to it, they're the ones who hate God. And those who hate God or reject the covenant are going to be punished. So in one sense, you can be chosen to be offered the covenant and called loved, but if you look at it and go, no, I don't want the covenant, I reject it, I don't believe the promise, you now hate God because you've rejected the covenant. Here it is, chapter six, 7, beginning in verse 6. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples on the face of the earth to be his people, his treasured possession. Verse 7 of chapter 7 of Deuteronomy. The Lord did not set his affection on you. Again, affection. Oh, I love you. No, think covenant. Think promise. I have chosen you. I loved you out of all the nations. You are the ones that are blessed. His affection you and chose you because you were more numerous than the other people, for you were the fewest of all the people. And it wasn't because you were the fewest that he chose. Oh, you're the underlings. And it's like, no, I chose you because of my decision. But it was because the Lord loved you and kept the oath he swore. Notice there, loved and kept the oath. He loved you by keeping this oath. To your forefathers, that'd be the patriarchs, that he brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the land of slavery, from the power of the Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God. He is faithful God, a faithful God, keeping his covenant of love, covenant of love, to the thousand generations of those who 
love him. He offers you a covenant of love, and you, if you will love him back and receive the covenant, a thousand generations, you're in. So does that mean you got that means you've got to respond to the covenant? Watch this, verse 10. But those who hate him, how do you know if you hate God? I hate God, you write it on your bumper sticker. No, those who hate him, will he will repay to their face. Oh, excuse me. Those who hate him, he will repay to their face by destruction. He will not show he will not be slow to repay to their face those who hate him. Therefore, take care to follow the commands, decrees, and laws. In other words, there is that chance of those who say no to the covenant. They're the ones who say they hate God and he rejects them. What we're going to see is, Jacob I have loved. That's in Malachi. Esau I have hated. Esau is the, or Jacob is the one who receives the covenant. Esau is the one who does not receive the covenant. In the Malachi context, the covenant goes this way. It does go this way. So he hates Esau and destroys him. Once again, if you read that, Esau is blessed. Esau is given a land. In fact, when Moses approaches the land of Edom, remember this? He says, I want to just cut through on the interstate with my people. The king says, no, no, no. You need to go around. We've got an environmental program going here. We want to preserve our, our, our wetlands. And Moses says, ah, you know, really, we'd really, it'd be so much, we'd just shoot right through here. We'd, we'd pick up our trash. We won't use your restrooms. We'll just go straight on through. The king answered with the military on the border. You misunderstood me. I said, no, go around. God says, Moses, yeah, you better go around. Now, this is the God, the Lord, who destroyed Egypt and brought Moses and his people out to the border of Edom. And when they get there, the king says, no, I want you guys to walk around my land. Boy, that's not how you talk to Moses and Joshua and the people of God. You know what we just did to Egypt? We're, we'll, we'll, just walk, we'll just tear that place apart. God, what do you think? Uh, I say, you better go around because I gave that to Edom. Walk around. That's their choice. So when the people of God, Israelites, approached Edom's land, and Edom said, they could, they could have said, yeah, then use the interstate. But when they says, no, our decision is, you can't walk through our land. God said, I gave that to them. He didn't hate Esau in the sense that he destroyed him. He even gave him life. He just did give him the covenant of love. He was a Gentile nation. Israel's a Gentile nation. They're blessed. They've got their land. They're in God's plan, just like all the Gentile world, waiting to be blessed by this plan, this promise. All nations will be blessed, but not all nations are the nation of Israel. So this whole concept, Jacob, I love Esau, I hate it doesn't mean I hate Esau, because otherwise, how did Esau become a great nation before Israel became a great nation? So again, we're not talking salvation here. We're talking the plan of salvation. We're talking the people of God who are bringing the plan into fulfillment. We're talking about God's covenant through Israel to bless all nations. There's nothing in here about people being chosen to be saved yet. Now, you may think it's going to come. But it's going to stay in this context throughout these chapters because Paul begins talking about what? He's already addressed salvation by faith throughout the first eight chapters. He's now saying, now, what about Israel? Did God's word fail? No, it did because God's got a covenant. These people may fail. God may have to adjust and respond to their hatred for his covenant. But this, this is, God's word is going to be fulfilled. And it's going to help us understand the end of the chapters 9, 10, 11. Now, that's where we're at right now. We've got to read, I want to read these verses next week. And pick this up again. And we'll probably use those same notes again, so that gives us a week of not having to make notes. I'd like to ask you if there's any questions, but we don't have time. And so if you want to ask a question after we close, you certainly can. Father, thank you again for the chance uh, to look into these things. We ask that we may again learn, that we may keep these things in perspective to help us understand who we are, to what you're doing in our lives, and what you're doing in the future. We can prepare and, and do the things you've called us to at this time. Father, we do again thank you for your faithless. I ask that we may continue to manifest your love to people, the nature of Jesus Christ in our lives, and our faithfulness to you and your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you very much.